Thanks. Uh, as uh, Will said, my name is Russell Good, and I practice down in Mobile, Alabama. Um, a few of the hospitals I take care of are kind of lower level hospitals, so we do end up seeing a fairly high amount of geriatric trauma. And that's where I've actually started <laughs> utilizing Illuminos mostly in the distal femur, although I have had uh, experience with it in the humerus. So far, I think we've done about 21 or so cases, I think Lisa and I were talking about, uh, utilizing the technology. So for anybody that's not familiar with it, it functions very similar to like a kyphoplasty balloon or an angioplasty balloon. Uh, with that, uh, the filler is an actual uh, monomer. And honestly, anybody that's ever had dental work, it's similar. I mean, the, you know, you layer on a little monomer, uh, the UV light goes over the top. And then at that point, uh, it starts to harden, uh, layer on a little bit more. Uh, the light source is a little bit different, but the whole concept is kind of the same. You're able to take what is more or less an angioplasty or kyphoplasty balloon, fill it with a monomer, and then harden it with light, similar to what you would use uh, with bone cement. And for me, that's really been the biggest, uh, honestly, the biggest benefit of it is, you know, in some of these distal femurs, you will have what is one, maybe two millimeters cortex. So by increasing the actual diameter, increasing the strut, you're essentially getting, at least for me, four, four cortices. You know, I will actually feel myself drill through the first cortex, hit the balloon after it's hardened, exit the balloon, and then hit the far cortex. So it's actually giving me what I, you know, feel to be a much larger strut in that area. You can see kind of from the procedural steps, uh, we'll use a small awl. At that point, the inducer sleeve goes in. Balloon feeds through that. And this part, I guess, is maybe a little bit of a fiddle factor right off the bat um, that is pretty easy to overcome. But as the balloon goes in, the inducer sleeve just actually splits down the side. Now, at the same time, your balloon's going to want to come back. So just keeping a little bit of pressure as it goes. Once that is in, uh, that is when you will actually fill up the balloon uh, with the monomer, the light source cures, and then at that point you've actually got your increased uh, cortical strut or increased strut. So here's just kind of a view of an application. Uh, this is around a previously uh, fixated proximal femur laterally, so we're approaching this from the medial side. But as you can see, the balloon goes in slowly we're inserting and you can kind of see the coil that is uh, around it's a tungsten coil around the outside of the balloon um, so that's where with some motion you can sometimes it looks like it is broken but it's really just a tungsten coil on the outside uh, that would be starting to rub and you can see how you actually get that big nice fit that then allows for the improved screw purchase and honestly for me um, post-operatively, I'm actually making a lot more of these patients weight bears tolerated right off the bat, similar to what we would do with like a dual plating construct or potentially a nail plate construct. With this, uh, from a stability standpoint, I'm feeling more confident letting this patient's weight bearers tolerated right away. Or it, here's another example of kind of intramedullary feel. And you can actually see here, I think this is a good example of the actual coil, as you can see, is much more into the shaft. Uh, in order to get kind of the most bang for my buck, um, I will insert, probably put in maybe about five, 10 cc's. And as I feel the balloon, see the balloon starting to expand, I then pull it back. And you can actually feel it kind of a butt against the cortex. That way, you know, you're actually getting as distal as is possible uh, so that the additional fixation with the screws you're getting more into that metaphyseal bone, which is gonna be kind of your weaker bone in that area to get the improvement in your overall purchase. This kind of shows all the different balloon sizes that are available. I've kind of circled the ones that I typically use. You know, I, I, it's an expanding implant. Uh, so with that, it will only get as big as the overall cortical fit. Um, the distal femur for me, that kind of 22 tapering down to 13 balloon. Uh, and I, I will actually kind of usually go ahead and just based off the x-rays, choose my size. Um, and the 22 to 13 taper balloon is what I'm using in the distal femur. Humerus, uh, particularly with some of the metastatic lesions that will stabilize, you know, I will usually measure the cortical, uh, the cortex 
And then we'll sometimes use a smaller balloon, but I find a lot of these patients, you know, they're patients I would normally previously have tried to stabilize with, you know, an intramedullary nail, which the system I use is either an eight or a nine. And I find that that is usually just toggling around inside the humerus. It's not really getting as much fit. So with those, if they're, you know, particularly wide open, we'll use a 17. If it's maybe a smaller individual, but still has, you know, a very large intramedullary uh, distance, maybe using a 13 or a 15 uh, for those from a humerus standpoint. And we kind of talk about this a little bit later from a technical standpoint. I started out in the humeruses just placing, you know, just three, five screws, you know, doing a two, five to three, five. And it honestly was kind of a struggle trying to find that 2.5 millimeter um, hole in the humerus. Uh, so I have switched to doing cannulated screws. I acknowledge that they're more expensive, but it has probably taken about 30 minutes of anesthesia time off the table for me in regards of, you know, how I was kind of struggling in that area, at least in my hands. So a little, you know, a little bit more expensive implant, but at the same time, anesthetic time and the time that the patient's under anesthesia and what is typically a frailer patient, I think, justifies it. So where am I using it now? It's really kind of in that poor skin or poor host patient. Um, you know, they've got the one or two millimeter cortexes, you know, I'm going to want to get that additional point of contact from a stability standpoint. Um, and then from a smaller incision, you know, I, as I kind of said before, these are patients that I would usually be doing a distal femur replacement or doing dual plating or a nail plate combo, which is going to be a much larger incision than making a small medially based incision to get that additional strut. So, you know, one patient that comes to mind was a lady who was, had HIV, diabetes, and was on dialysis. I mean, at that point, I am wanting to make as small as a surgical insult as possible from a soft tissue standpoint, because she just has wound breakdown written all over. Um, again, I have actually started doing less distal femur replacements since I've started utilizing this technology. Um, fractures that I thought were previously potentially too distal or had too much comminution, I'm getting the stability that I'm wanting uh, by having that medially based strut, or in certain instances, medial and lateral struts, which I utilized in one of our patients that had a very large multiple myeloma lesion in the distal femur. And then supplementing all that, of course, with a laterally based plate. From a speed standpoint, I mean, it's not all about speed, but the less that we can have, you know, what is potentially a compromised or frail patient under anesthesia, I think there's benefit. So, you know, at this point, as opposed to having a larger anteriorly based incision, I typically, if I'm going to dual plate, I do just a straight anterior incision. Uh, sometimes I have to do a small supplementary lateral incision, but I'm kind of hedging myself on the chance that the dual plating were to not go into a union. I've only, I've already got my incision made for what would be my bail out there, which would be the distal femur replacement. So, but in this case, I'm having less dissection because I'm only using a small medially based incision and then just a typical lateral incision going through the vastus, or lifting the vastus. So here is a patient uh, that one of my uh, arthroplasty colleagues referred over to me just to see what my thoughts were. A very distally based fracture. Um, you know, we talked about whether or not distal femur replacement was the better option for him. Uh, but, you know, and that's really with this guy, we had to kind of slow him down because he came to clinic at like two or three weeks and he's telling me, I feel good. I want to walk on it. I'm like, whoa, you know, you don't have the body habitus to do that. You know, you're kind of pushing 300 with a very distal based. Uh, so, you know, we did let him go full weight bearing uh, without restrictions at six weeks. And then we've got his three month x-rays here that show uh, the, you know, where he's got good cortical contact, he's not taking any medications and is back to his regular activities. So from a separation standpoint, uh, this is another kind of little technical uh, trick. Uh, you wanna make sure that whenever you cut, that you actually cut the balloon and leave enough of the actual extension in order to score right at the balloon edge like you would like like scoring concrete and then at that point there's an extraction handle that you butt directly up against the score pull it backwards and that actually pulls off the plastic or metal portion 
Um, I have had a little bit of the plastic uh, still be attached at the very tip. Um, I will usually stick my finger in there and just kind of run it around. It's just kind of my neuroses. But even with that, it's just a little hub of plastic. And I'll usually take a little small uh, rongeur and just nibble that area off. And, you know, at that point, it's nice. It's flush. It's, it's kind of what I would want. So here is a point that I think is actually pretty important. We do stress examinations on every single patient. So, you know, after we're done, I want to make sure that is this really enough? So if that's, if it's not, then maybe I would, you know, go back in and add additional medial plating. But I think, you know, you can see from this lady here who had a previous nail, we actually threaded a limpening through the knee joint. So all the motion there, no real motion up around where her fracture site was before. Um, the additional uh, check from a stress examination standpoint also lets me really kind of say, you know, am I going to put them in a hinge knee brace? I kind of did that a lot at first. Uh, I think I was treating myself more than anything. Uh, but at this point, I've really gotten away from using hinge knee braces. Or if, I, if, I, if I'm still wanting to kind of give myself a little bit better sleep, I will order a hinge knee brace, but really only have the patient utilize it when they're up and working with uh, physical therapy to prevent those very... So from a technical standpoint, I would say this. Um, don't try to improve your reduction with a collinear clamp until the monomer has cured. Um, I had one fracture that we had threaded the balloon up, uh, started to expand it. I felt like I was actually starting to push my fracture out a little bit. So I had my laterally based plate with my hook coming over the top and I tried to ratchet it down a little bit and actually punctured the cortex. So at that point, I start to try to fill a little bit, don't realize it right at first, and I'm not getting that kind of back pressure. So at that point, we deflated the balloon, removed it. I usually irrigate with three liters of normal saline at the end. Uh, it's uh, something I learned up at Mizzou. I like it from an infection standpoint, so, uh, right there at the end from a closure standpoint. So we used about a liter of fluid. I could kind of feel over the top, irrigated out the wo uh, wound, replaced the balloon, re-insufflated, uh, let it harden, and, you know, afterwards, it was the first time it happened, so I felt around in the wound. I'm looking to feel whether or not I've got any hardened uh, monomer in and around the tissues. Didn't feel any, so, you know. But until the monomer's hardened, don't go at it with sharp things because it is just a balloon. It'll pop. Um, as I said, I inflate the balloon with about 5 or 10 cc's, pull it back. That way I can really kind of get that balloon distally where I want to get that screw purchase. Uh, starting point, I kind of starting low and centrally. Uh, I did have one early on where I got a good AP starting point, but when I actually looked at my lateral after choosing my all, I was a little anterior. So variable angle screws, I was able to angle those more anteriorly to still get the purchase that I wanted, but kind of a little learning point for me in regards of making sure that I've got that good starting point. And as I said, for the humeruses, the cannulated screws, I just found them to be easier for independent cannulated screws and eccentrically placed. Um, it's just been a little bit less of a struggle for some of those. And this kind of sh is showing that curved all and getting that kind of lower starting point where I'm gonna wanna kind of get the increased density of my screw purchase in that area. So, um, that is kind of my experience with it so far. Um, that's my cell phone, uh, my email as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, I don't ever mind talking. Uh, you know, obviously we'll answer some questions now, but at the same point, you know, down the road, uh, questions this or anything else, I'm pretty open.